Hi, uh, this is my first lecture I'm doing, uh, a mini lecture on the money multiplier. First time I've done something like this uh, for my Patreon audience. Of course, I'm putting it up on YouTube to be generally available, but if Patreon subscribers will get the spreadsheets and the Excel file, everything else I put together to explain this little lecture. The reason I'm giving this one is twofold. One, a uh, belief that the money multiplier describes how money is created is an extremely popular delusion in economics and government policy. and it's also, as it happens, a lecture which I gave at uh, Kingston um, because I changed the screen resolution at one stage and unintentionally the size of the actual lecture of this on my uh, YouTube is about one, one quarter the size of the screen you'll see right now. You couldn't actually uh, work out what the hell I was talking about. So this is a double whammy. Cover this little issue that seems to keep on dropping up as people's way of thinking about how the economy operates. Uh, and replacing a, a dud lecture on YouTube. So if you look at uh, Bernanke's essays on the Great Depression, uh, he blamed the Great Depression on a contraction of money and world money supplies, which he again blamed on the authorities, in particular the Federal Reserve, and said if you look at the data, it's the only country where discretionary aspects of policy was destabilizing, and the ratio of the monetary based to international reserves fell. Uh, more importantly, nominal money growth was zero, uh, between these periods, 1929, sector uh, quarter four to 1930 quarter four, nominal money supply fell. So he's blaming all, the, blaming all this on the Federal Reserve and said the cause of this was a contraction in the ratio of base to reserves, which reinforced rather than offset declines in the money multiplier. And this is where he said that the uh, much of the blame lies on the Federal Reserve. Now the reason that's useful background is because. He clearly took his own theory seriously when the crisis struck back in 2008 uh, because he had an enormous increase in base money. This is well before the uh, QE started to happen. And you take a look at it, it's quite a remarkable graph. Bang. Since you're watching this video, you know that I'm a leading critic of conventional economics and also a developer of a realistic alternative. And now I need your help. After you've watched this video, pop over to Patreon and support my work for as little as one dollar a month. Okay, there's an increase uh, in terms of, th this is actually absolute uh, dollars, so of course there's going to be some tendency to rise uh, over time, but look what happens during the crisis. Wham! Bernanke just steps on the uh, reserve creation uh, accelerator. As a percentage of GDP, what you see as well is quite remarkable. There was a, a, a back in the, the 30s and 40s and 50s, it was running at about between 10 and 15 percent of GDP. Progressively fell till the 1980s, rose a bit until the uh, uh, 2009. And then, under policy influence of Bernanke, it goes to levels that are simply unprecedented. And the UK did much the same thing. So you see, zilch, and then bang, all of a sudden, dramatic increase in the uh, level of, of uh, the base money. And I think I've got the graph here, percentage, yep, percentage of GDP. So a long term of decline down to virtually zero, and then bang, this huge increase again to levels which are unprecedented in English economic history right back to 1870. Now, the rationale for this huge increase of reserves is that it would stimulate the economy by the money multiplier, which is why I want to talk about this particular idea here. And you find it turning up in the public speech Bernanke uh, gave, which is published in the New York Times, where he's trying to explain why uh, the rescue went to the banks rather than going to the public. And uh, we've got a classic of Arma line inside there, where one says, where's my stimulus, they say. And he says, a dollar of capital in a bank can actually result in eight or ten dollars of loans Notice that of loans to families and businesses, a multiplier effect that can ultimately lead to a faster pace of economic growth. So he's clearly using the money, the money multiplier as an argument for the policy of giving money to the banks uh, through TARP and schemes like that rather than giving it to the public. Now, it's based on a textbook model that says if you increase reserves, you'll increase lending by more than one to one and stimulate the economy that way. So you add reserves to a uh, the accounts of a private bank at the Federal Reserve. They then lend out, lend out a multiple of this over time, stimulating the economy. And this is a typical textbook example here. Uh, we have reserves being added to the banking system. The first bank holds the required percentage. It's called the RRR, the required reserve ratio. Holds, say, 20% of the money that's been deposited. Uh, in America, that happens to be 10% right now of household loans. It's actually quite uh, amazing how little of the deposits it applies to when you take a, a detailed look at it. 
that hangs on to 10%, lends out the rest, and then through an iterative process you create money. So this is a, a typical spreadsheet from, uh, where is this from, some show, economics.li. Yeah, I found that one uh, just on the web. So let's actually take a look at a typical spreadsheet example of this. And the idea is, here's your required ratio. I've got 20% in there to get a, a more rapid decline in the numbers, but I'll, I'll change it to 10% just to illustrate it. So the required reserve ratio in this model is 20% of any deposit should has to be held as reserve. So you have an initial deposit of 1,000, which means somebody goes to the bank and drops $1,000 in, and the bank allegedly hangs on to $200, which is 20% of the 1,000, and loans out 800. And the person who gets the loan then goes and deposits that at a second bank, and that second bank hangs on to 20%, which is 160, and loans out 640. And then the person who gets that loan goes and deposits that in another bank, uh, which means this bank hangs at 128, lends out 512, and on you go. And at each stage, additional deposits are being created. To write down the end, you get, you're getting close to 5,000, which is 20, uh, 1,000 divided by 0.2, which is the required reserve ratio. Now, if I make that, say, 10%, whoops, pardon me, if I make that 10% here, then you'll get, we're heading towards $10,000 as the amount. Of course, it'll take longer in this iterative process to get there because you're still getting the whole thing going on to infinity in this model. So that's the basic idea, and that says fundamentally that the Federal Reserve is in control of the money supply because it can inject those reserves into the system, create the deposit that somebody, uh, the cash that somebody deposits in a bank, and they set the reserve required ratio in a bank. That's why they control the amount of money in the economy. So that's the basic logic there. But when you look at empirically, it crashed during the financial crisis. It was obviously there's a trend of heading down. The M1 multipliers gone from three back in the uh, late 1980s down to just over 1.5 before the crisis begin, but then it absolutely plunges to less than one. Well, the reason it could be less than one, by the way, is that uh, M1 does not include M0. So M0 are the, are the reserves, uh, the, 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 bank, the bank accounts of the private banks at the Federal Reserve plus, I think, plus vault cash, uh, whereas M1 is the amount of money in deposit and check, in check uh, fund of what we, do, we used to call check accounts. So they don't, M1 doesn't include M0, so the ratio can be less than 1. But the theory is it's supposed to be much, much greater than 1. So something went slightly wrong there. Let's, let's go back to the presentation and, and check and see. Uh, now, what you find intriguing is that this is a textbook model. Does that mean that the top practitioners believe it actually describes reality? I'll explain why it's unfortunate towards the end of the lecture, but unfortunately they do. Because here's Bernanke giving a lecture at the School of England School of Economics back in 2009, saying that there are people have concerned that if the Federal Reserve effectively prints money, that'll ultimately cause inflation. And they said, well, there has been an increase in excess reserves. And that's the narrowest part of uh, uh, the definition of money. But banks are choosing to leave the great bulk of their excess reserves idle. In other words, they could lend it out, but they're deciding not to. Now, that's something you say to a um, group of students, maybe you don't actually say that when you're seriously planning how to run the Federal Reserve. No, let's take a look at Mr. Reif Schneider, Federal Reserve statistician uh, during the crisis, saying that when you look at the experience from Japan, uh, the belief was if you pile up enough excess reserves, the banks won't want them anymore and they'll begin to lend them. So it's definitely a proposition that banks, given excess reserves, can lend them out to the public. Uh, he said, well, that's what actually happened in Japan. Uh, it never happened. So if we go back a few months and look at what's uh, happening here in, in December, could it work this way? Uh, it seems that you can run up lots of excess reserves and banks will just accept it. That's back in 2009, of course, right in the middle of the crisis. Now, then we go further on to look at uh, Jeffrey Lacker, president of the Richmond Fed, and he's saying that the usual prediction would have been that this amount of reserves would have led to an explosion in M2, an explosion of lending, a burst in inflation. Again, seeing this more than one multiple relationship between uh, reserves created and the money in circulation given the money multiplier model. But he said banks holding of treasuries have all gone up to 200 billion, so it doesn't seem as though we're engineering a substitution of reserves for debt. Uh, it seems banks have substantially increased their demand for liquid assets. So it must be banks deciding they want to actually hang on to that, and that's why we aren't getting this money multiplier effect. That's back in December of 2009. 
Now, it's still worried, and this is now Charles Blosser, who's quite a prominent member of the Federal Reserve, uh, back in, again, December 2009, saying that maybe it's going to be a more robust recovery. Well, tough luck, Charles. It didn't actually happen, did it? Uh, if so, we'll need to reduce monetary policy accommodation. And as real rates rise, the opportunity cost of banks hanging on to vast excess reserves may lead to a rapid increase in the money multiplier and a conversion of excess reserves into loans or borrowed money. Now, again, this is a serious proposition about what's supposed to happen technically in the banking sector in America. So that's the overall set of beliefs. So they've given on going. It's a, it's a treasure trap being able to get hold of the uh, Federal Reserve transcripts these days. So he said, in my opinion, as long as we have trillions of dollars in excess reserves, uh, we have to move the rate on excess reserves and, and the funds rate in lockstep with each other because the IOER is the real determinant of a bank's willingness to lend out reserves. So this is seriously accepting the money multiple model accurately describes what actually happens in the economy 2011 here. So why did it fail? Well, because fails it doesn't exist. It's simply a false model. And I want to indicate why this is the case. But I'll start with the, uh, the Bank of England first of all. And the paper offers numerous references to money creation in the modern economy. And they state just very blankly that the reality of how money is created differs from the description found in some, meaning almost all, economic textbooks. But rather than banks receiving deposits and lending them out, bank lending creates deposits. And in normal times, a bank doesn't fix up uh, the, money, the amount of money in circulation, nor is central bank money multiplied up into more loans and deposits. They're simply saying the model is wrong. Uh, and then if you take a look at a Federal Reserve research paper on this topic, does it actually exist? Uh, they'd say that, you know, yes, okay, the textbook gives you this simple idea of uh, a causal role for reserves in the quantity of money and the amount of bank lending. Uh, and this tight linkage implies the central bank controls the money supply. And they say, looking at this, it seems it's implausible. Uh, the quantity of, of, of reserves themselves doesn't seem likely to trigger rapid increase in lending. So they say it doesn't actually work. And the reason it doesn't work, it's simply bloody impossible. I mean, being a bit of an Australian here, it simply violates the rules of accounting that are an essential part of how banks operate. So I need to explain why how banks actually go about creating money, how they handle their, their accounting. And the basic idea of double, double entry bookkeeping uh, goes right back to the Renaissance Italy. And there's a, a brilliant history by Jane Gleason White of double entry bookkeeping, how it came about, how it was used to, well, both actually to properly record transactions, but also, to, you know, it's a nice way to do fraud as well if you made several sets of books. Um, but the essential idea was you accurately record the accounting by entering every transaction twice in a single row on each ledger, and therefore it sums to zero. It occurs once as a positive sum, the second time as a negative sum, and a properly accounted row therefore sums to zero. So long as you make sure each of the rows sums to zero, you know you're properly accounted for all the financial transactions you're looking at. And there were three types of accounts that were used. Assets, which are a positive for the relevant entity, Liability, pardon me, liabilities, which are effectively a negative. If you, the more you have of those, the less net worth you have. And the net worth is the difference between the value of your assets and the value of your liabilities. And the fundamental law of accounting, as it's called, is that assets minus liabilities equals equity. And that's treating each of those as a, a positive sum. So A minus L is equal to E. That's how you work out what your worth, your net worth is. And of course, you can rearrange that and say I minus L minus E equals zero, which is this idea of, of getting a balance of zero on each row. Now, the convention that accountants use, and I find this quite confusing, but we've nonetheless implemented this in Minsky as an option, is they record everything as debits or credits, DR and CR, and there's different ways that classified for assets versus liabilities. Now, I've used a different convention in Minsky, and I think it's, it's slightly more intuitive to some extent. There's one counterintuitive part to it, but once you get your head around that, it's easy to um, to work with. And that is that you show assets as a positive, and that makes sense. You show liabilities as a negative, and that makes sense. So adding assets to liabilities now tells you what your net worth is. And what you do with your equity, you also show that as a negative. Now that's counterintuitive, but the basic idea behind it is that makes sure that every row sums to zero when you add them up. So if you have A minus L minus E equals zero when you treat each of them as a positive, your alternative when you say assets are a positive and both liabilities and equity are negative, then you add the three together, you should get zero. So A plus L plus E, where L and E are both treated as negative amounts, 
must give you zero for a properly accounting row. Now that's a simulation, uh, that's the, the technique that Minsky uses to make sure you make every, every row correct. And then what you, that's actually now a model what banks actually do according to the Bank of England. So what they say is that banks originate by creating, uh, they make a loan and that creates a deposit. And I'll show you the basic logic of this. I'll build it up in a Minsky model if I press the right key here. Okay, so here's Minsky. And why am I not getting there? Come on, good. Okay. Click on the banking icon, drop it somewhere on the screen, double click or right click and choose Open Godly Table. And then uh, let's now, I hope you can see the text of this. This is one reason I tried to change the size. Um, with um, my lecture and got it all stuffed up. Now, um, as I mentioned in, in the lecture, I've learned the importance of double entry by designing Minsky. So initially, it was possible to have single entry tables in Minsky. Uh, we haven't yet made it impossible not to have them, but normally the default is it's double entry. And you then get a choice of, you've got to choose from a, dro a drop down saying whether something is an asset, a liability, or an equi or equity. So first of all, I'm going to have an asset, and I'll call this reserves. Click the plus key, I can create an additional asset, and I'll call this loans. And then create another column, and I'm going to label this as a liability. So I'm going to now talk about deposits, and I'll just, for the sake of making this uh, possible to modify um, and have multiple banks in it, I'll put firms here as, as with the entry for the liabilities. And then I'm going to have here equity of the bank, and I'm going to call this uh, equity of underscore bank B1 because I'm going to use more than one bank in the model ultimately. And what the Bank of England said is that loans create deposits. So if you have the, a loan to fir the firms, the firm sector, then I can type this amount here, lend underscore F lend to firms. That's the positive entry. And then to make the accounting correct, I've got to show a negative entry Pardon me, just trying to grab the edge here and make this larger so you can say, ah, ah, one pixel. It's so but one of the hassles about a high resolution screen is you're trying to capture one pixel and it's not easy. So notice currently that Minsky is telling me that the row sum is positive lend f, which is an indication I've got to type a minus lend f, lend underscore f somewhere to balance that line. So that's now correct. So lend to the firm sector. Then let's create an additional row here. I don't know what that, that's, that's a bug, seeing the O in there is one of the little bugs we still haven't got rid of. Repay debt, let's say then have a look at the, uh, the firm sector repaying. I'll make a repay underscore F, so repay by the firms. And that therefore reduces the amount of the loan outstanding. That's what you'd expect. So that row is correct. And now I'll say pay interest. This is the basic operation. So in this case, you make an interest payment I'll call this INT underscore F, and that becomes something which goes into the equity account of the bank, and that's what's creating, uh, that's the reason the bank is making a loan to get interest payments out of it. Let's get this bloody line. Okay. Okay. I can't get rid of the Owens, it's just one of those bugs Russell hasn't had a chance to track down yet. So that's the basic story. That's, that's what the, Federal, the, the, the Bank of England says happens when banks make loans. And that's easy to show, as you can see, every row sums to zero. Lending here increases the assets as a positive. Uh, it increases the liabilities in magnitude because that's a negative, and repayment reduces the uh, uh, the um, uh, assets and reduces the liabilities of the banking sector as well. That's easy to show in Minsky. So you have a positive increase here. You have a negative increase there of exactly the same magnitude. And the row sums to zero. Everything's cool. Now let's try showing lending out reserves. Well, that's real fun. So I'm going to go back over here and imagine you're going to lend from reserves. So let's bring up Minsky in the background. There's the spreadsheet of the uh, godly table. Now I'm going to type lend from reserves. Well, you know, you're going to lend from. Doesn't that mean you've got to have minus? Here, let's have minus lend, and I'll call this lend underscore for reserves. Okay, so you got a minus there because you're lending from reserves. So what do you put over here? Well, if you want to balance that, you've got to have a positive. That's actually taking money out 
of somebody's account. It's not putting money in there at all. That gives you a correct accounting, but that's actually reducing the amount of money inside the firm sector. Uh, it's not it's not increasing money at all. What you have to have there to show it rising has got to be a minus. You type minus there, and Minsky says, hey, your row doesn't balance. So you simply can't use this as a way. You can't lend from reserves. Lending from implies reducing what you've got as an asset. If you reduce your asset, you have to reduce your liabilities, not increase them. Now, often people think, well, what you can actually do, first of all, is show that uh, what you're doing is, first of all, you create the loan. So I'm just using the trigger Minsky to drag that across over here. So you have reserves go down, the loans go up. That's cool. Okay, I've done that. But then, how do you actually show that there's money created over here? You've created the loan, but you haven't shown any money creation over here, how can you lend somebody if you don't actually give them the money? So that doesn't work. So what you've got to really show is, well, uh, we've got to give them some money over here now, so we need to have this uh, a minus lend over here. Let's make this minus lend underscore R again. That's minus. We've got to balance it with a plus over here. Oh, well, that's all we can do is really, we, we don't, we're not going to increase the loan anymore. That would be wrong. So let's just make this lend underscore R here. Okay, now it makes sense. But what's the point of reserves? You suppose like then from them, then you've cancelled them again. You've had a minus on reserves to whack them into the loans. And then to record, you've actually gave somebody some money, so they're actually indebted to you. You put a minus here to increase the liabilities now, and you balance over here with an uh, increase in your reserves. So you've cancelled it out. The reserves have played no role whatsoever in actually creating that loan. So the problem here is it just doesn't make sense applying the rule of accounting to show that you can lend from reserves. Now, what about if you start saying, well, let's imagine that the Federal Reserve creates excess reserves, and therefore you've got uh, an asset and a liability of the reserves in that case. So we go across to the um, central bank, and let's just now go back to Minsky, and I'll whack in an extra bank icon here and call this the central bank. And then that's what I'm doing over here in terms of my definitions. So I've got uh, CB loans and then reserves. Okay, well, here and I'm going to say, okay, the asset are going to be loans by the central bank. So CB underscore curly brackets. So I get the word formatted the way I want it to on Minsky's table here. Pardon me, flipping from one view to another in that point. So there's the assets. And then that's, uh, that is the liabilities, of course, of the central bank. So what are the liabilities? You click on the down arrow and Minsky tells you whatever assets haven't been allocated to somebody else as a liability. Well, that's reserves. So I've now got that uh, included in the little system here. So I come over here to Minsky, back to this for the central bank view, and this is the view for the private banks at this stage. Now, let's say you create excess reserves. And what you show here, let's just use word excess as I've done on the spreadsheet and the uh, PowerPoint file. So there's the excess, meaning the reserves, reserves, loans go up, and you have minus excess to balance on the li liability of the central bank. That now turns up down here, you'll find. I'll just get rid of that blank row there. So now there's the excess reserves. We've got to balance that by saying there's a, a liability as well. So I'm just going to create an additional column here move that back over the other side and what did I call that in the spreadsheet? Okay, I think I'm actually going to check and see. The private bank ledger, okay. Well, they've now got a liability, of course, which is the loans from the central bank. So let's just go back over here again, pardon me. Just imagine you make some of you dizzy here. Yeah. Okay, so we've now got excess reserves there, which is an asset for the banking sector, but they've got a new liability as well. What are the available liabilities? Click here loans for the central bank. So we now have, this is the reason I've gone through this rigmarole, I've now got the reserves turning up as a liability for the banking sector as well. And the idea is that maybe they could lend from the liability rather than the asset, which is arbitrage. So let's just try to see if we can model that. So now I've got excess reserves here. Well, let's try to lend from reserves too. And what we're now going to have is a loan from this excess, which is a, the liability of the bank of the um, 
banking sector to the central bank. Let's imagine they lend out a liability instead. So I'll call this lend underscore E for lend excess. So that's liability is falling, which is what you want to show. And you can show over here, therefore, that there's going to be money being deposited in the firm's account. So yes, you've created the uh, um, the additional loan. So yep, so far looks great. There's only really one problem. You haven't recorded they owe you any money. So let's how do you do it? Well, you record the loan in that case. Record the loan from reserves. Okay, so that's called end loan and So we've got to type a lend underscore e here, which means you've increased that asset now. Well, how do you then show it? Well, you've got to now have a, a minus lend e over here to reduce the because you've, you've increased the assets uh, by the banking sector. You know, and you increase the uh, the liabilities by as much. So you whack it back in there again. And once you've done that, everything balances okay. But look again, you've again cancelled out the lending from the liabilities, lending the excess reserves. You've just, they played no role. You've added them in, you've cancelled them out again. No matter what you do, you either make an accounting, a strict accounting error, or you do it properly, but you then show that the reserves play no role in actually creating the money. So that, that's, you know, that's that's the correct item I've shown here. Again, can they lend from the liability? I've just shown that they can't, but let's now repeat it. So you now have the uh, lend from excess reserves, uh, you know, that's the same operation I've shown you a moment ago. Uh, but then, of course, everything sums to zero. That's cool. But no sign of any debt. You've given them the borrower money effectively without recording the OU money. That, that'd be a nice bank. I wouldn't mind banking with that bank. Uh, so what do you do? You've got to then show the reserves on the next line as I've done. Cancels out. It cancels out what you've done beforehand. You might as well not worry with reserves in the first place. So you know, imagine you could whack a non-bank financial institution inside there and present everything as off the books, etc., etc. But the point is, what looks like a nice, simple model in the minds of economists, when you try to apply it as, a, as it has to be done by any firm following accounting rules, and any bank that doesn't, well, I don't know if there's a few that would hide what they do, but anything that does it as a matter of course uh, ends up being shut down. Uh, so it just doesn't work. It doesn't make any sense. The reserves are not there for lending. They're there to enable banks to make transfers between themselves when your shopping and my shopping or our financial transactions mean that money has to transfer from one bank to another. And then it's just simply a way of echoing the transactions we're doing between our individual bank accounts with the banks that we therefore cause changes in their uh, in their, in their stocks of reserves. They're not used for lending, they're used to settle accounts. It's part of the whole settlement process between banks is using and shuffling those reserves. So all that stuff boosting the excess reserves did bugger all. Um, it, it was like pouring lubricating oil into a car that had run out of gas. Great. Um, now I won't go on to talk about QE here because I've actually done a bit more work on QE since I wrote this lecture. As part of what I've done is my submission to the um, Treasury uh, Committee of the uh, English Parliament, so I'll leave that for later. But that's the basic idea. Reserves play no role in lending. It is simply a myth. And there's two terrifying things about this. One, that economists believe this myth to begin with when it simply can't, it, it violates the laws of it, rules of accounting on which you can't, you, you can't reduce economics to accounting, but if you get, if you're getting, your economic theory involves making literal errors in accounting, then stuff, forget it. You haven't got an accurate model of the economy. Uh, and also the really terrifying thing is that this was partly behind, behind the, the, pol the rescue policies that the central banks imposed was a fallacious vision of how money is created that means they can't simply, they simply can't work. So there's much ado about nothing about central bank policy, unfortunately. Okay, I'll leave it at that. I hope it's a useful little mini lecture and I hope it fixes up the one that uh, people have been trying to read on, on YouTube. Thank you.